Hello, uh, I'm John Wedger, and this is one in a series of interviews I've done regarding um, whistleblowing. I myself uh, am a police whistleblower, and I stood up and exposed the cover-up involving child prostitution in London over um, over the last couple of decades, and that was back in early 2000s. Um, since leaving the police, uh, I've continued to campaign for the truth to be exposed and uh, the fields expand because the more I look into it the more I realise how much um, child abuse has its roots in everything else uh, that seems to go wrong in society. Um, over the past few months I've interviewed other police whistleblowers, I've interviewed um, uh, people from the, well, go from the prison system and today um, I'm very privileged to be interviewing James. This is James. Um, James, his story very much dovetails into mine. Um, we're going to let James explain it, um, but in my introduction it's just that uh, I um, worked with child prostitutes. A lot of them had, had sort of very uh, chaotic and transient lifestyles and at the time they weren't taken seriously. In fact, the police didn't plough any resources into investigating it. Um, James, his story is very similar to many other victims and survivors of abuse in the fact that James is a, uh, a byproduct of, of the care system and, uh, well, so-called care system. And then on, upon leaving, um, his life went a, a different way and it sort of ties in with the kids that I was dealing with. So, uh, um, I've got a bit of a cold, James, so apologise me if I'm a bit snotty. And we're, anyway, we're... We're in North London, uh, you don't need to know the exact location, and, and I thank you, James, for coming forward and speaking out. Um, so, if we go back, can you tell us a little bit about your life to start with, James? Uh, my life for started, I was uh, deserted by my mother in a, in a workhouse, I think I was four years old. And... Uh, my next recollection is foster care. I was in foster care and their name was the Poulters. I always seem to remember that, even at that early age and today. What part, what part of the country are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about London, Edmonton. Right, okay. And I was in foster care there and I can remember not not the husband, but the elder children used to touch me and lock me away in a cupboard and stand against it so I couldn't get out. And the only other thing I remember is that that I felt uh, I knew what they were doing to me was wrong, was wrong. And my next recollection was being in uh, a care home called uh, Woodvale, no. Woodvale Care Home, where I can remember getting beaten with a heavy wooden brush, long handled brush. And I can even remember the man, his name was Mr. Thomas. Well, can we just go back to that? So you, you were saying at the age of four that you was taken into the care of the government. Yeah. Uh, they put you into a foster placement, as it were. Did, yeah. And this family, um, really, they, they started the abuse on you. Yes. And even at such an early age, you was aware of what was going on. Yes, I did. And then from there, you're now put into an institution. Yeah. And we've now got this guy, Mr. Thomas, that Mr. is Thomas. hitting you with a wooden brush. Can you tell me yeah. what age you were? I was six years old then. Six right. years old. I was at Woodvale, which my project shows for about just over three months. But the, the he he run one of the houses. He run one of the houses, but I wasn't beaten in one of them houses at all, because I don't remember ever being in one of them houses. But I do remember another. There was a block apart from all the houses, 
and that's where he used to beat me in there. Can you tell us a bit, if you can, about the beating, what that entailed? Well, she just beat me with a hairbrush all over the body, all over the body. And the more I cried, the harder he hit me. The harder he hit me. If we, if we could sort of like, just, just bring this home to people. I mean, we're talking about a child at the age of four is abandoned. You know, the trauma that in itself must bring about. And instead of dealing with the emotional needs, poor James from the ages of four to six is put in a in such a, a dysfunctional area and now he's just being brutalized by a man with a wooden brush i mean it just defies any sort of belief doesn't it and and this is a man who's doing it and being paid by the government to do it and yeah. and at that time was you alone in in this treatment or were there others that were getting it as well i, I, I can't really speak for the others but you know, I have heard that lots of others have come forward, you know, and not everyone was uh, had a bad childhood there, you know, and but there are others that are speaking to the police, I've been told. Right, can, can we just go on, because the time when I was looking at the kids' homes, they were usually like an old Victorian house which was divided up and they had about five to six children. What, what sort of um, decade were we dealing with here? What was we're dealing with the 50s. 1950s. Can, yeah. can you just explain that, you know, sort of like what the kids' homes were like in them days, well, physically? Well, in the 1950s, uh, children's homes like Hutton, which is in Chamfer, Wessex, was a vast, vast, large care home. Had three football pitches, cricket pitch, tennis court, their own gym, their own swimming pool, and it used to house 48 boys and girls in every house. And there was about 10 houses cool. there at Hutton. Uh, I was abused at Hutton, but I was never sex abused at Hutton. But there's a few, few children who I, I know as grown-ups who were sex abused there. Yeah? Abused, yeah. I've had a cricket ball thrown in my face by a member of staff because I failed to catch it. And I've been beaten in Hutton. And I ran away three times and every time I come back I was beaten. And I could name the man who, who used to do that. Mr Weeks, his name was. He used to beat us and put us in cold baths for hours. And, and, what, and what was his rationale for that? Do you ever explain it? What was his? his? His reason for doing it, do you ever explain it? I know you can't answer for him, but... Well, when I ran away, he, he had to stay up. He had to stay up. Right. Or he would go and collect us, and he didn't like that. He didn't like So you it. inconvenienced the man. and Yeah, his... right. we in inconvenienced him, yeah. So he decided then to yeah. physically but, beat you. As I him. said, I wasn't sex abused there. I wasn't sex abused. If, if we could go from Woodvale... Uh, where was Woodvale? Woodvale was up in South London. South right. London. And right up near Shirley Oaks. Shirley Oaks. Right. And as we've seen, Shirley Oaks, the horrors that went on there. Yeah. I've you know, so, uh, I mean, what we're looking at um, is th th these care homes, which obviously um, had a lot of government money ploughed into them and were probably fully furnished and, and funded by the, the government. And we're seeing a consistent pattern of behaviour by the staff. And a lot of it is physical and sexual in nature. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that, that, that need to be answered by the local authorities <coughs> as to why this was allowed to happen. So we, we take Woodvale. If we, we, we take it now, move the timeline yeah. forward. Yeah. The next thing I remember is coming out of Bounster Station. I was still six years old. The memories are so vivid. I come out of Bounster Station. There was a woman holding my hand as we walked along the dirt path by the railway. And she said to me, the exact words, you have to go back. You have to go back. Now, I don't remember ever, ever being in Beach Home before. So we're talking about a place called yeah, Beach, Beach Home, really Beach Home in Banstead. Banstead, sorry. Right. But I don't remember 
being in that home before or being taken out of it. But when I arrived at the home, we go through the iron gates, I turn left and on the right hand side was called the girl's end. Now, Jasmine House. When I entered, I was left, the woman walked away. I don't know who it was, it could have been a care worker, could have been a social worker, I don't know. But as I was taken in, Miss Cullen, I will name her, Miss Cullen took me in a room, stripped me and beat me badly. What for? I don't know. How old was you, James? I was six then. Six years old. I don't understand why she done that. Was it because I had played up? Or, or because I remember being there. I don't remember, I'm sorry being there before but obviously I was so I wouldn't but, remember that voice of that woman telling me you have to go back and and I can tell by even your description the building there's still strong memories in your head oh, yeah. can you can you just describe to us Miss Cullen what, what she physically and Miss Cullen you know. was a big set lady uh, her name was Margaret Cullen as I found out but but the other member of staff used to call her Peggy for some reason, right. which I don't know. She was a bully, a bully. She well, was a it. bully. Every night after tea, she would line the boys up while the girls were still sitting at the food table and she would take down our pants, all the boys, and smack our bottoms hard. This happened every night after tea. Right, let's just describe the, the location now. So say in the food hall, right, how was it laid out, the food hall? It was like a dining room in a house. Right. And you had the girls used to sit on the right hand side and the boys used to sit on the left hand side. Right, and, and the age groups? And what the age group, I would say, I was six and there was girls and boys there about, 10 or 11 years so, old. So we, we go from infants <coughs> up to sort of getting on for the teens. Yeah. So you've got the girls on one side, boys on the other, and you're saying this happened every evening. Every, every evening. And, and how would the situation manifest itself? What would happen for that to go on? What, the beating? The beating, yeah. She used it for no reason, but she never, ever done it to the girls. Right, so the, the girls were present... Yeah, they were watching, yeah. They were watching, and so you're saying they, they, she stripped her? Yeah. So she, you're stripping off young boys all the way up until early teens in front of girls. Yeah. How many boys would you say there were? Seven or eight, roughly. Seven or eight yeah. in, in front of a, a load of young girls, strip you naked, and then one by one, smack you, yeah. beat you. Yeah, beat us, yeah. Was ever an explanation given for this? No. I mean, it, it, all I would say to people that are listening, can you imagine if you have children at that age doing it to your kids? I mean, it's just sadistic and per perverse in the very least. And the fact that she's doing it with so many people, she's obviously very comfortable with doing this yeah. and has done it before. And, and I'm wondering how many complaints have been made against this woman. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't even know if she's still alive, but I mean... How long did this go on for, James? This went on for as long as I was in Beach Home. And I honestly cannot say how long I was there. My records show that, it seems to show I was there four years. Right. But I can't honestly remember being there that long, you know, because where I was taken out, but where I was taken to, I don't know. I can't remember where I was taken to. What I can remember though, was when they served figs and custard for afters that, yeah. where I was sick into the bowl and Miss Cullen made me eat my own oh. vomit. I mean, oh James, if, if ever you, you wanna the call it a day, you, you just let me know. Uh -huh. I mean, it's just appalling. It, and, and do, do you know, what makes this worse is that I've heard similar stories from so many people 
This seems to see, be like a British disease. This went on in care home after care home after care home. You know, impressionable young kids that have got a gap in their life because of absent parents. All they need is time, love and support. And these evil, evil bastards are doing this to kids. How dare they? How dare they? And um, James, so if we take your yourself up to 10 years old, unless if there's anything in between you need to tell me about, please do. Well, there is. Yeah, go at, on. At night times. Right, okay. Men used to come into the dormitory and take boys downstairs. They took me down a few times. They blindfolded us and made us face the wall in the little corridor. And we used to stand there. And I could hear men's voices in the room, in the room. And what puzzled me, like, not then, but in these days that I know, there was never, ever any staff mem members in Jasmine House. So Jasmine House was purely female staff? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. these were either men from other houses or from outside the home. And they used to take us one at a time downstairs. And they took me into the, to the room the women had left because I heard the door shut. They were talking and they took me into the room. And they spoke and they spoke. And what they did was they forced what I now believe was something hard in my mouth, which I believe was their penises. Right, okay. And told me to suck. And then one of them shouted out, he's no good. It, He's biting, he's biting. Oh. Now, the funny thing is with that, was that in the, in the home, there was a headmaster in Beach Home called John, oh, what was his name? Oh, well, it'll come, it'll come to you, yeah. no doubt. Just call it out when you remember it. Yeah. And he was the school headmaster, and yet, over the years, as I told Surrey Police, that name comes into my head. Why? I don't know. I don't know why it comes into my head. Sometimes I'm thinking he's one of the men who was in that, uh, in that room. Did, did you ever there. actually get to see the men? No. But it was dark. No. So, uh, they used to take us back blindfolded. So when they... When they got you in the room, would you go on your own or were you with other boys? On, on their own. Because at nights, they used to take other boys down. Who would retrieve you from your bed? A man. A man. Would come in and, in yeah, the dormitory? Yeah, come in the dormitory. It's pitch black in them dormitories. Right. And he'll, he'll put a blindfold or something round your eyes right. and he'll lead you downstairs. My God. And... Uh, how calculated. At nights, I was terrified to go to sleep. We would be. I was crying. I was always crying. And when another boy was taken down, I felt so much relief. Yeah. It wasn't me. I hated myself for that, knowing what's going to happen to that boy. To that boy. How... Oh, it's just... It's evil. <coughs> It is evil, and they knew what they were doing. And do you know what makes it worse, Jane? They knew that you were orphan kids and no one was coming to help you, you know? And that headmaster, I've got his name now, of the school inside Beach Home, John Kelly. Kelly, right. That oh, is right. the name that stuck in my mind, and I, I don't know why it's in my mind. I do believe, though I can't say for sure, he well could be one of them men in that room. That's why I remember his name, but I wouldn't swear on that. Right. You know? Did did you as lads ever discuss it with yourselves? No, no. Because at, at, when it was playtime, I used to stand alone, and there was a couple of other boys standing alone as well. They didn't mix in with the other children, you know. And... We never really talked to her at all. There was just one person whose name I knew. His name was Roger, but I don't know his surname. I don't know his surname. D 
James, what happened if you had interaction with the outside world, as it were? Were you educated on that site, or was you educated outside? I don't ever remember going to school at Beecher. Even though they had this school there, I do not remember ever going to that school. I, I think when we when we met last time, you, you were saying to me that you weren't allowed to interact with the other kids. No, we wasn't. We wasn't. They were told not to talk to you and... Yeah, yeah. What happened was, that was at Hutton, that was. Hutton? Hutton, yeah, right. where, where we had Bishop Hill Primary School there. Where was Hutton? Shenfield, Essex. Oh, Shenfield, right, in Essex. And the children from outside the home used to come to the school there. And they, and they were told by their parents not to talk to them. I think there has been a police investigation into that home in Essex. Yeah, I think I, I recall it. Right, there were, the man who abused two of my friends there was a Mr Brabazon who got arrested and sentenced to six months. Six months, unbelievable. But the abuse was never investigated, never investigated. They put it down to... Corporal punishment was allowed in them days. Reasonable and chastisement. Argued yeah. with them, that didn't include child sex abuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, we're seeing this a lot with um, uh, certain inquiries when people are coming forward. They're instantly being denigrated because of their criminal past. And as we know that um, a lot of kids that have been through the system end up in trouble. You know, and they end up with yeah. things like shoplifting on their record, and that instantly, in the eyes of the law, under the new Criminal Justice Act of two thousand three, gives you bad character. Yeah. So I've been. I was sent to Ballstall. I've done Ballstall. Yeah, in Gainesville. I've been to prison. I'm not proud. James, you've got to survive in the environment you're in. You know, and no. I mean, it's it's like most things. This story needs to be told. The UK needs to know what went on, otherwise this will be forgotten about, they'll class it as it was a mistake, we've learnt our lessons, we moved on. They knew what they were doing. This is typical of so many care homes up and down the country. It's almost uniform. We're hearing it time and time and time again and we are seeing cover-ups time and time. And the other thing, James, we'll get back to, the, to, to your account, but I want to say it, a lot of these local authorities, they knew what was going on and they've been advised by their insurers not to say anything. So it's insurance companies that are steering this perversion injustice, blocking the truth coming out, and shame on them. And we have got this independent inquiry, but we keep seeing that frustrated time and time again. I myself was allocated a core participant status on it. When my evidence went in, which was classed as credible, corroborative, and something else, the government amended the parameters so I was not allowed to give evidence so we're just seeing constant cover-ups this is going to be when this gets out this is going to be a national shame I, I think this is on the scale of the holocaust myself how many people James have committed suicide drunk themselves to death drug addiction because of the lifestyle that was meted out to them mercilessly in these care homes this is appalling and it needs to be stopped but if, if we go back see we, we've gone through what was going on at night and then you, you, you're sort of moving through your life into your adolescence. How did things progress from there? Well, Hutton was my last children's home and uh, the governor of the home called me in, I think I was 14 then, because in them days you could leave care, you left school at that age yeah. in my day and he felt that I should stay on there for two years because I wasn't ready to face the outside world. So I accepted that. And then I, I got a... My mother can't... I was 12 years old in that and that's the first time I've ever seen my mother or even remembered her. She visited me, she stayed half hour and then she left. About a few weeks later, being 13 years old, I was allowed a home visit. And my mother had asked if I could have a weekend with her and a boyfriend, which I thought, that's good, because I could get to know her. Yeah. She met me at Liberal Street Station. We went to her boyfriend's home. 
which was a flat in Baltimore House. Where's that, Baltimore House? That's in uh, Houston. Right up, right, okay. Yeah. And she stood there and watched him sex abuse me oh. that night. On the, on the Saturday, I went back to the home. I was asked by Mr. Bill, why you come back? And I, I, I couldn't, couldn't tell him. I, don't, oh. it, I just couldn't tell him. And I just pretended that there was a football match because I was football mad, you know. And uh, I, so when it came to the day that when I was 16, I remember saying I've got, I can't rely on care all my life, all no. my life. I have to stand on my own two feet. So I told Mr. Bill, who was my housemaster there, I want to leave. He said, are you sure, James? I said, yeah, I'm certain. I said, I've got to stand on my own two feet sometime. I cannot rely on care homes. Come the day I was leaving, I had nowhere to go. There was nowhere I could go. I was given no aftercare. I was just going to say aftercare. Anyone. And I had nowhere. And as I stepped out of them gates, I wanted to step back in. Oh, God. I was so frightened. Oh, my word. Uh, and you're 16 years old. And if we go back, the, the, the one person that you wanted to build a relationship betrayed you. Yeah. And then when you was in the homes, was there anyone that was ever sympathetic or compassionate, teacher-wise? or In Beach Home there was, in Beach Home, because... I can remember in whilst in Hutton there was other boys. I better explain it. Mr. Dicker was my main housemaster. He's a, he was a lovely man. Right. And he got the deputy governor's job in Beach Hunt. Right. Okay. And even though it hurt, some of the the boys who he got really, I, t- I was allowed to take them to Beach Hunt. Right. Where his uh, property. Deputy, there was just on the left of the gates to the left, right. and it, and I bumped into Miss Kilbane, who was one of the beach home women in Jasmine House, and she just looked at me, and she said, "I'm so sorry." James. So she knew, <laughs> she knew what was going on, and I was going to say that the staff must know what yeah. their colleagues are doing. They must do, and this comes back to what I've been saying. In order for the triumph of evil, it takes but for good men to do nothing. People, you can't stand by and let this happen because if you happen, these defenceless kids get hurt and this is what we've seen happen time and time and time again, you know. Um, so, I mean, we, we need to give a, a shout out to the ones that actually did show a bit of heart because they're a lifeline sometimes, these people. Well, I honestly believe that there must have been someone in Beecham, in Hun, who would have run the council's responsibility yeah. now and tell them what Told them, of course they would have done. I really believe yeah. someone, whether the man staff or a woman staff, done that. Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And there would have been ex-pupils that were before you yeah. that would have said something. Yeah. There would have been cleaning staff that would have seen yeah, it. You know, and, and I understand some people that when they're working, I saw it in the police, you work in a very chaotic, frenetic environment and you become a bit hardened and what goes on the practice, you sort of ignore them. I sort of get that, but there, there is a line and, and certain things are just out of order. You know, I yeah, saw it with a cover up of child abuse. Yeah. I saw things going on in the police, which I had no need to step in and they were wrong, they were illegal. And I no no need to step in and say, no, I'm not, you know, getting, but when it was a cover up of child sexual abuse, I weren't having it. I just there was no way on this planet I was going to put up with that. Um, I did tell Miss Cullen about what was going on, what they were doing to me in the home, yeah. sex abusing me, and all she the exact words I could never forget that one. You know where little boys who tell lies go to dark places. Oh, and is that what you want, James? And I said no. And the reason I never spoke about it anymore, as I was only sick, I knew I had at least another 10 years. Cool, yeah, self-preservation, James. To go in care. 
Can, can I can I ask you with um, sorry mate, I'm getting a bit. Uh, uh, the, these kids' homes, did any of them ever have a mental institution next door? Uh, not that I'm aware. It, of. Not that it's I'm not relevant. I wouldn't know about Beach Home. They could have had a Beach Home, but at Hutton, I don't think they did. Uh, they could have done. They had Brentwood and Wally mental home, which was about two miles. Did you ever get threatened with being placed in them institutions? The only time I got threatened was when I was about it was either 13 or 14, I honestly can't remember. We were invited to the Billy Cotton Band Christmas show. Right. There was a busload of us, we went there. And uh, we had Russ Conway at the back, who we used Can we to just explain who Billy Cotton and Russ Conway for people that might be too young to... Yeah, they, uh, Billy Cotton was the leader of the band show. Russ Conway was the piano player of the... Of you know, I used to come on every show, play the piano. Right. And I went to the toilet, and while I was in the toilet, a man come in, and he said to me, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to, I'm going to the toilet. And he come over, and he put his hands down my back of my trousers and held my bottom. The door opened, a man came in, he said, what the are you doing? And he, he told me to get out, which I did do. And where Russ Conway's piano was at behind the stage, he was like entertaining. I, I walked over to him and I waited. I can exactly remember, I waited. And as that man come out, I said, who's that man there? He said, that's Alan Breeze, the resident singer on the Billy Cotton Band show. Right, and he's the one who assaulted you. He's the one, yeah. And what happened was, when we got back to Hutton, I told Mr. Horovich, who was the governor of the home, what had happened. He said he'd deal with it. And as I'd left school in those times from 14, I, you know, I, st I, I was in the home. I just wandered aimlessly about and everything. And he, he said he would deal with it. About two weeks later, Mr. Bill, my, he said, we're going to London tomorrow, James. So I said, what are we going for London for? He said, we're going to London tomorrow, I'll let you know. So we went to London and we arrived at the Maudsley Mental Hospital. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was taken inside yeah. and I told them all about it and they wanted to admit me. Who, who are you saying they? Who did you tell? The doctors. The doctors, yeah, okay. They wanted to admit me, but I ran out of the hospital and run down the road. And then Mr. Bill come out, I said, I'm not staying in there, I'm not staying in there. He said, I've told them you're not staying there, you're going to come back. So they were going to section you? They were going to section For me. being the victim of sexual abuse by a celebrity? At the BBC. Unbelievable. Now, what I've found out is, if you're sectioned, then everything you know or what happened to you is not going to be believed. Well, they govern you. They'll go. Yeah. They take responsibility for you yeah. as a person. You're discredited. Well, and, so. the, and this is, you know, James. Um, there's a, a fellow I'm meeting with tomorrow, and I met with him before, and he's one of the the country's top child psychologists, and he's saying ninety percent of mental health problems they they have their roots in childhood trauma. You know, we're looking at a, a, a volcano here which all, all roads lead to child abuse. It's unbelievable. But, you know, as if you hadn't been through enough and then you get that weirdo doing that to you. Yeah. Let's take this now because um, I can see it, it, it's an emotive side of it, but if we could just imagine being 16 years of old age, you, you, you have no one that you can trust. You're vulnerable. There's a big world out there. And you're on your own. You're just literally on your own. Nowhere to live. There's no aftercare. There's nothing. And all you know is abuse. Yet you would rather have that than be thrown out onto the streets. And James, you never went back to the home. You went forward. I went forward. You left that gates. Where did you go to? I went to Euston Station. And uh, Why Euston? I just remembered the, the, the things of of uh, where they live, where my mother and that Okay, yeah, yeah. I headed for there. 
and I sat in the waiting room with just a bag of clothes. What time of year was it, James? This time of year. I don't know. I think it could be the winter years. Cool. Or autumn, autumn and then winter. Right. And then some boys come in. They were younger than me. And they looked at me. Uh, and it was strange because one of them said, was you in care? Uh, how old were the lads, James? 12, 13. 12 and 13? Yeah. My word. So. And I told them I was in care. They were runaways. Yeah. They were runaways, but they were streetwise. Oh. They were streetwise. And we formed a group and they looked after me. And they saved my life, really. Do, you know, we're, we're not talking about a third world country, you know, like Brazil or Bangladesh. We're, we're talking about the UK. And, and what year would this be? This would be 1962. So we're talking about affluent years when a country is economically on the way up and we've got this underbelly of runaway kids that have run away, probably, I'm assuming now, from the care system yeah, or yeah. abusive backgrounds. They were from the care system. So, so where were they living? Where were you, what were you doing with your time? What we'd done, we lived on the streets of that. We started living on the streets. We stayed in a group because... You were safer in a group. You were safer. Right. Can you, let's explain that. What part of London? I'm uh, talking about the West End. The West End. Why were you safer in a group? I know, and you know, but if people are listening, for what reason were you you're safer? You're safer in a group because if you're alone, you're an easy target. You're an easy. You've target got to explain that as well. Pedophile. Pedophiles, right? You're an easy target. I mean. I've been to the arcades, I've been to Playland, I've been to all the arcades, you know, and we always stayed in a group, always. Or at least two in a group, two in a group, never on our own. And that's how we lived on the streets. Uh, they knew the places, they were streetwise, they knew how we can survive, how we can get money. And I've been with them, I've been with them, two of them to Dolphin Square two of the boys. I've been to Eccleston Square to a Muse flat. I didn't go in any of that, the Muse flats because they just went on their own. They do, it was a Muse flat on the left hand side of Eccleston can, Square. Can we break that down into its individual bits? Right, so you've got Playland. Yeah. Right, I've, now there's a book that's just been written about Playland yeah. and it's about the child prostitution scene within the Piccadilly area. So can you just tell us what would go on in Playland? Playland, you'll be approached. And what it was? Playland was an amusement arcade, a big amusement arcade. And you'll be approached by men. And they, they would come and put pennies in them days, pennies in your machine and press themselves against the show. And uh, as long as you stayed in a group, you know, we accepted them putting money in there. We accepted it, you know. We, but as long as we stayed in that group, we were safe. And what we did these safe. men want? Oh, they wanted to, they wanted to sex, sex. They wanted sex. That's what they come yeah, for. Definitely. Right. You know, and we used to sit in a wimpy bar in Piccadilly Circus, around that way. And there was loads of other boys in there, you know. And that's where a lot of the boys were picked up there. They were picked up there in them wimpy For the bars. purpose of prostitution. Yeah, yeah. And, and it had a term, didn't it? The, that, the wimpy bar, that yeah. area. Oh, it was called a meat rack. The, the meat rack. Yeah. You know, and even that, when I was on Vice, it was still on its way out, but it yeah. was still an active... Yeah, I like, stood on the meat rack once, once. Never again did I go back there. Oh. So you, you, you've you mentioned a couple of venues. Uh, the first one you mentioned, Dolphin Square. Yeah. Right. Now, Dolphin Square has made national media news lately. Yeah. I remember Dolphin Square from when I was working at West End, and I know that it was a resident block um, in Pimlico, and there was a, quite a lot of politicians were housed there. Yeah. Why would you go to Dolphin Square? Because uh, the other boys who had lived on the streets longer... 
that was one of their venues to go what? to earn money or get a gift so we could sell it. What, what, what would be expected in exchange of money? I don't mean to be graphic, but... Sex. Sex, right, yeah, yeah. okay. I mean, uh, you know, three of us went in there, in there, three but three of us. And I don't want to say which boy they took into the bedroom. Right. But they took a boy into another room. Now, Conifer knows who the boy was. Yep. Yeah. And uh, obviously they sex abused. And we were told to wait outside, which we did do. And uh, he came out with money. He came out with money, which we ate that day, you know. We ate that day and uh, we, wa we wasn't rent boys. I, I don't class us. I class us as survivors Survive, yeah, yeah, yeah. of the streets. Yeah. Because you have to do things you would never do to survive. Now, now, I I worked the other side of it. I was on vice patrols and we would heavily police, uh, covertly police that area in plain clothes on a night duty. And you got to know who was on the street and who wasn't. You had a lot of informants working. And on top of that, there was a heavy uniform police presence. Now, I knew of kids that were living on the street and luckily I did my best to do something about it. Did you have any interactions with the police at all? We used to avoid the police. We used to avoid them. Beyond. Did they know that you were, you were about? I believe they did, yeah. yeah. I believe they did. You see, no one really gave their right name. Yeah. You know, no one gave their well, right name. Well, you can't blame them, can you? Because... As I said, I wasn't a runaway. I had run away three times from that and took back by police, you know. And, you know, they use aliases, names, you know, these boys. And uh, we used to, as I said, we used to, like, like the minders, they call them minders of the boys, yeah? It's all right, there's someone in there. And we used to call them the catchers. That was our name for them, the catchers. Because if you were caught by any of them, you could disappear off the streets or end up being passed around in Pedro. Did, did you know of any lads that that did happen to? Well, there was one, my best mate, John Hilton, who was uh, having problems at home. I used to meet him every day outside Angel Station. And in the end, he joined the group because he was having problems with his nan and everything, and he joined the group. And one day, while we were in Playland, all of us, like there was six of us, six or seven of us, I turned around and he was gone, he had gone. So I asked the I said, where's John got? And they said, we don't know. So. We tore, We went out and walked down Old Compton Street and yeah, checked yeah. all the other arcades. And to this day, I had so much help from Twitter, people sending me things, looking for John. He's never been found. Never been found. Do you know, I, found. I heard a very similar story for a guy who's probably the same age group as you, same life, and he was saying about, he went to get into a Rolls Royce car round by Piccadilly, and saying it's his pimp but it was his mate he said don't go in there the last two boys that went in that car we never saw him again he did get in because he was doing a lot of drugs needed to pay for it and he was in his early teens and they tortured him to the point of he nearly died his whole intestines were so badly damaged you know and they're in, he said he generally to this day says their intention was to kill me so there are sexual predators out there that, that, that kill you know and this is happening in the heart of, of what they always class London as having the lowest crime rate of any Western city, yet there is this perverse underbelly that I think will rival even the worst third world country, you know. And I would defy anyone <laughs> in law enforcement to say they, they weren't aware this was going on because I know for a fact when I exposed it, I was told by a senior officer, you've got no idea who or what you're dealing with. You've got to shut the F up. So they knew, the police knew, the yeah. dedicated teams knew what was going on. And I'm telling you now, James, the reason you were con allowed to continue to do it because they did soddle about it, you know. But you, you go on 
about another venue, Eccleston Square. Yeah. Now, Eccleston Square is in Victoria by the coach station. Yeah. yeah, can you explain a little bit about Eccleston Square and what was going on? Well, what happened, we went to Eccleston Square. We entered by Victoria Station. So yeah, we yeah. Went to Eccleston Square. And on the left, there was a Muse house, which a house in their day, but now I know. An old Victorian there. type house, yeah. yeah. And the three boys, they entered it. I didn't go, go into the house. And I, we always knew if you, we are separated, you make your way back to Euston Station. Right, that is your little focal point. Did. And I waited for them. And hours later, they came back and they had money. They had money. You know? And after a while, they said, which, you know, may sound not right. They said to me, you have to earn your keep with us. No one judging your ear, James, mate. You no. Know? And uh, they were right, I did. I couldn't mm. rely on them all the time. So I ended up as a sex cell in my body. Yeah, yeah. I did, I did. Well, like we said, you have to survive in yeah, the environment you're in. you have to survive, yeah. you know. I ended up selling my body. I mean, it's a testament to your resilience. You're still here today. How old are you now? Yeah, I'm 72. 72, yeah. you see? So you got this far and, and it's important this story gets yeah. told. It is. I mean, there was other venues we went to, Hampstead Eve. We went to yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's very car well. Car park there. There was two car parks. Right. One I haven't mentioned was uh, the uh, God. I can't remember the name now. Of a pub is this? It's a pub. Ah, the Spaniards Inn. The Spaniards, right? Down yeah. Spaniards. We got Road. two big pubs up there, haven't we? Yeah, and that was a big car park there, and we've been there before. And uh, we, I went into the. Jack Straw's Castle car park, yeah. that's where we used to wait. We yeah. used to wait. It's a big car park where it used to go down and bear to the left. It's still you, a car park today, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Where you couldn't be seen. And and in the in the wooded area is a big gay cruising area and oh, it's yeah, still to this yeah. day. If police came down into there, we used to run into the woods. What, 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 what is bizarre as well is that I know officers that worked Hampstead and they were always told stay away from the woods at night you know there was cruising going on yeah. as they call it yeah. just next to it is is like a children's like zoo where so kids and families are walking through it yet the police had a reluctance to go and address the issue as yeah. i said when when we were touting up there uh if we escaped into the woods it's vast woods up there. oh yes yeah, massive yeah the police never used to yeah. follow us you know what i mean but what would go on in the car parks? You know, we, we don't need to be graphic, but there'll be some people go, well, so what, it's a car park? What? There wasn't just us there. There was other boys, older boys, younger boys, and cars used to pull in and pick these boys up, pick these boys up. And there is one thing I have to say. Yeah, you go ahead. That when me and John once were walking through Grosvenor Square, this car pulled up. And he asked if we wanted a lift. So we said no and just walked on. Grosvenor Square is in Mayfair. It's where the American Embassy is. Yeah. Right. So we were, no, we said no. Because as we walked on through Grosvenor Square, down the sides, you come to Piccadilly. Yeah. Well, anyway, it didn't dawn on me. It didn't dawn on me. But when we were up in Hampstead in the car park one night, this car pulls up. And this man gets out. The other boys knew him. They said, this is Uncle Eddie. Right. And when I looked at him, I thought, I know that face. I've seen him before. I've seen him before. And it was Edward Heath. It was Edward right. Heath. And what year are we talking about? We're talking about 62, 1962. What, what year did he come to office? He was a prime minister. Know. He wasn't an MP then. Oh, Prime Minister then, he you mean? He wasn't Prime Minister, right. there was an MP. There was an MP, right. And as as I've found out, like, through, through where I speak out, he wouldn't have had a protection officer with him. Yeah, 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 of course not. No, no, no. Because he's just an MP. An MP, exactly. And then it was come out, then I, then Surrey Police visited me, and they asked me about it, I told them all about it. 
I said, did he have a car, Daniel? He said, yes, he did have a car. And so what happened was then his secretary, Teddy secretary, stated that he, Teddy couldn't drive, didn't have a car, never had a driving license. Right, right. I, I had people on Twitter saying, you were wrong, James. Right. He, he couldn't drive. And right. I, I, I said, trust me, he, he had a car. And it was proved right. Right. I never budged from that story. I knew who I saw and I knew who it was. So, so they're trying to discredit you by saying that it couldn't have been him because he don't yeah. drive. And, he didn't and you said, car. well, this man did drive yeah. and he had a car. Yeah. And it later came out in the national media that, that he did drive himself. And he did have cars. You know, he had a set of well, false number plates as well. Uh, it, it just shows a level of cover-up. Now, now, we see that with... Um, someone who, who's very influential to me, and that's a chief constable called Mike Veal, and he was the chief constable of Wiltshire. He proceeded with the allegations against Ted Heath for the abuse of children, and they went out their way. The national media, even th this week uh, weekend, we had the Daily Mail trying to attack him, um, just by stating, you know, this is what happened, and they they, they virtually tried to destroy that man. So this just goes to show that whenever anyone speaks out and says the truth. We get attacked, and then you get lawyers and the police that are overzealous with contempt laws. But what are we doing? We're telling the truth. We're trying to expose the worst criminality, which has the biggest detriment to society. And all of a sudden, we're the bad guys. It's perverse in the least, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know. And this man went on to be a prime minister, and they would have known. The security services would have known what he was doing. No two ways about it. If they know what I'm up to and James is up to, sure enough, they'll know what someone who, who potentially going to go on to become prime minister is doing, because it's a national. It's just it's a national. We've gone on to say that um, you left the care home, you met up with a group of runaways, which were aged from 12 upwards. I mean, how young a 12? Anyone who's got a 12 year old kid, how? I mean, I've got a 28 year old who's immature, yeah. but a, a 12 year old, my God, living go it alone. And was never seen of again, and we can only draw the inference that these sickos got hold of him and killed him. Yeah, I you know? believe that because uh, it, there were so many helping me, so many making phone calls, so many finding addresses. They were ringing them addresses, and he couldn't be found. And ja James, can I just ask that the, the people that uh, we were, were you, you know, were using you as a client? Could could you sum them up in one word? Were they from a certain background, or were they diverse, or or what? You know, oh, they were well educated, well educated, right? And they seemed to have money, money people, plenty for money, right? It was like, as I said, when the boy came back, who Ted he picked up, he came back with a musical box, and then oh, right. he's having a musical box. Only the rich had them. No, oh, okay. So they paid him in a musical box. Yeah, we sold it. We sold. We got ten shillings for it. It's a lot of money in them days. A lot of money, you know. And and where, where, where were day to day living? Where was you sleeping? And we used to sleep on flat roofs. We and then we found a, a disused railway line, which was open. It the trains never run there. Well, okay. It was a, uh, a disused railway hut. Oh right, like an old shed, like there, in the railway shed. <laughs> we used to sleep there, yeah. And uh, 62, 63, it was bitterly cold, bitterly cold. And you know, at, at that time, as I was saying, I just wanted to lay down and die. I really did. God. Oh, James. Oh, it's not been easy for you. No, but I still get the flashbacks. Well, 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 this is the other thing, you know. I mean, how many years ago was that? We're talking over fifty years ago, and and we can still see the, the pain it's causing now. Yeah. In your opinion, do you think that that what you endured? Do you think it's still going on to this day? Yeah, it's definitely still going. And on. And, and, and do you know something? We're looking at um, emergency services having their numbers cut. Police numbers have been massively slashed. You know, they're putting bare minimum staff out. So they're not, not that they did anything anyway, but at least there was dedicated units that were going out there um, under the guise of looking for these kids. There's none of that now. So there is no protection now 
you know, in fact, less than when you was there. You know, it, it will never stop until until this country wakes yeah. up to what, what what happened. You know, until these governments expose their VIP yeah. child sex abusers. You know, it will never stop. It will never stop. And that's a tragedy. That's why I fight for kids in care today. But they're just used as a commodity, James. These kids are used as a commodity and it's something I've been saying. And the system just makes money out of them. Instead of ploughing the money in, in, into restorative justice, how much money does it cost? £8,000 a day for a trial. You look at how much it costs to keep a kid in care for a week, ten grand. You look at how much money spent on, on uh, family courts, on solicitors and lawyers. Why is that money not being put in the right place to stop this abuse? And like we've seen, James's story is not alone. You know, the guy I work closely with, Bill, he went through a very similar background, and then Chris Fate and so many others went through all this. We're hearing it time and time and time again. And how many are the silent voices, the ones that have killed themselves through addiction, you know, deliberate suicide or have ended up like, like we alluded to earlier in mental institutions with no voice and it is like i keep saying it, it's a national tragedy this has to stop and it needs people like james to be given the protection to speak out you know and shame on all those police officers that knew what these protection officers which knew what their bosses the politicians were doing and yet said nothing where is their morality? Where is their heart? Where, you know, do you know what I mean? It's wrong. The law has to change where people cannot sit on this information. It has to be changed. But James, you have broken the cycle because you have gone on, you know, to continue another family and everything else, you know. And, and now you're, you're a real strong campaigner. You know, that's how I got to know you and, and other victims and everything else. So a difference is getting made. Yeah, I've got my own family, you know, so that's a good thing in yeah. my life, you know. I've got 15 grandchildren. 15? And uh, they're my world, you know. No wonder you're always skint, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, But they're my world, you know. Of course. And, uh, you know, when I look at them, I don't want other children to go through with what I had to yeah, suffer yeah. In, in my child right on. on the street. Yeah. That shouldn't happen to any child. No. After care has to be given to every child living in care, no matter what age they are. Well, 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 we've got to stop them going into care in the first place. I know that things break down in the home, and unfortunately <laughs> circumstances arise where the government need to intervene. Everyone gets that. No one's got a problem with that. But what we, we can't have is when there is endemic systemic abuse. And if we go back to what you were saying, James, about uh, Mrs. Cullen, what she was doing was calculated and perverse. Yeah, yeah. And it was a ritual that she did every day. And she enjoyed and, it. And she enjoyed it. Yeah. And not only that, when she was doing it, you can't tell me other staff never saw her doing it. They knew what yeah. she was doing. And, and you think that woman would have then gone on to the educational authority and reported back saying, our children are healthy, they're attending, they're alert, they're, and she'll be getting a good living wage for doing what she's doing. Like one of the staff members there, I mentioned Miss Cullen, there was a Miss Morden there, who left Beach Home to work in Shirley Oaks. Now, I no doubt the Shirley Oaks team will yeah. be aware of her. Yeah. You know, and, and for those who don't know about Shirley Oaks, it was the largest children's home in Europe. Yeah. And uh, we're just seeing now through the campaigning groups, through the survivors groups, what went on there. And then we're having another one that um, Bill Maloney exposed up in uh, Medemsley Care Home. They've now got, I think, yeah. 1,500. Yeah. Two came forward at first, now 1,500. Yeah. Uh, we saw it in Hope de la Grande in Jersey. We're just seeing it boom, 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 you know, constantly, constantly coming out. And unfortunately, when people do speak out, as, as I'm a testimony to, we, we, we get hurt and we get damaged, but we can't give up. We can't, you know. I'll never give up. No, no. And, and, uh, and that's that. Well, look, we've been talking a long time and I'm desperate for another cup of tea. No, and I'm sure you are, right, James. And no. listen... <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, uh, I would love to go through the comments because the comments have been coming through and please others if you want to come forward get in touch 
um, and let's see if we can sort this all out together. God bless you all. God bless you, James. Thank you so much. Uh, let's stop this. Oh, sorry about this. I'm going to have to... Uh, uh, uh.